Um, so I've been granted the honor to introduce our keynote speaker for NetDev. Um, before that, I have a question. How many people have heard of IETF? Raise your hand. How many people have actually been to an IETF meeting? Okay, that, that's actually uh, pretty good. So, um, so we, every NetDev, we um, sit down and we actually choose the speaker. Um, kind of an interesting process. And this time around, we have a, a kind of interesting um, choice in that we're actually going to go into IETF um, kind of interaction with uh, open source. Um, this is important, and it's important because IETF is the standards body of the internet and to a large extent. Um, it's like implementers in Linux and other OSs, they're actually implementing the protocols. So these two kind of have to somehow match. So our guest speaker today is actually the chair of IETF, um, a um, fellow at Cisco, I believe. And so I'd like to introduce uh, Elisa Cooper. So uh, thank you, Tom, for that introduction, and um, huge thanks to Jamal and uh, the other organizers, first of all, for co-locating with the IETF. Um, we're, we're really happy to uh, have that happen twice in less than one year and to see the interactions between the two communities. Um, hopefully, we'll see more of that, uh, in particular, after I give this talk today. Um, I am not a Linux kernel developer. I don't even really write standards anymore, but I do spend a lot of time uh, trying to make it so that people who want to collaborate in order to make the internet work better um, can do that and can do it more efficiently um, and can have more success in, in those kinds of interactions. So that's really what I want to talk to you about today, um, open source, the IETF, and you. Uh, for people who are not terribly familiar with the IETF, which it sounds like um, some, some fraction of the room. Um, the IETF produces standards based on an open process. So anybody can participate. All the participation is on an individual basis. Um, so there's, uh, you know, people's employers support them, but there's no company representation. There's no membership. And the decisions are made on the basis of uh, broad-based consensus. So uh, we don't come to the end and say, uh, this protocol should be designed this way. We're going to take a vote. Uh, we try to get a sense of the room to figure out if everybody who's been involved really thinks this is the right design, if the objections that have been raised have uh, at least been debated, even if they haven't been addressed. Um, and that's kind of the flavor that we like to work in, and we think it, we think it produces uh, the, the best outcomes. And we really try to focus ar around technical merit and technical excellence, so we don't let the business drivers uh, be the de determining factor. We try to think about what's going to work the best uh, at internet scale and make our determinations that way. The standards that we produce are documented in RFCs. You've probably read some of these. Um, and I think nobody would ever really look at an IETF RFC and say, wow, we have this great spec. Why would we need an implementation? That's not something that people say. But something that people do say is, we have a great implementation of something. What do we need a spec for? What do we need standards for? And I think people who ask that question might be on the path to trying to convince you that open source and open standards are adversaries. And they would be wrong. On the internet today, we have a lot of different models for how open source and open standards are um, working together, coexisting, and being developed together. So sometimes you do get an implementation first, and then later, it, People come and try to contribute that idea to the IETF or to another standards organization, and you end up standardizing a very similar design to what was originally implemented. Sometimes it goes the other way around. Sometimes we develop a standard first, and the implementations come later. Uh, sometimes, and I think increasingly, what we're seeing is a sort of parallel co-development of standards and implementations um, at the same time among the same people who are working on both. I don't think there's any single model of this that's really the right model. It really depends on what is the specific piece of technology that we're talking about, which part of the stack are we in, what are we trying to achieve. Um, there's not really like a one-size-fits-all that can tell you, oh yeah, 
It's, it's open source forever and no standards or vice versa. Today what I'm going to do is walk through two different examples of that, of that last kind of model that I talked about, the parallel development of, uh, of standards and uh, implementations. Because I think it's an uh, interesting moment in the evolution of how we work within the IETF that shows really the value of implementations and the value of this cross-pollination. So the first example is going to be TLS 1.3, which was finalized last year. And the second example is QUIC, which is um, currently still under development. I'm also going to use these two examples to talk a little bit about protocol ossification, uh, uh, maybe a favorite topic among some of you, certainly a very common topic um, in the IETF um, and the, the networking industry. And then at the end, I'm going to explain a little bit about how you can get more involved in the IETF, um, what some of the opportunities are for collaboration, um, and hopefully induce you to uh, come join us in our, in our standards efforts. Um, so there should be time at the end, I hope, for discussion, um, questions, comments, um, throw tomatoes, whatever you want to do. Um, and also, lucky for you, I don't have a lot of content on the slides because I didn't really think there was much visual to be represented, so you just get to listen to me talk. So starting with TLS 1.3. Um, if we go back to the prior version of TLS 1.2, 1.2 um, was specified in uh, 2008. The, the standard was published in 2008. And it took five years before there was support for TLS 1.2 in the major browsers, Chrome and Firefox. At that point, five years later, about 11% of websites were supporting TLS 1.2. Uh, so that's kind of the, the implementation story, the, de the deployment story for TLS 1.2. We can compare to TLS 1.3. So TLS 1.3 was, um, the work started some years ago, it was finalized in August of last year, and it had a few objectives. Um, wanted to remove some of the crypto algorithms that had been proven to be vulnerable in the time since 1.2 was finalized. Um, wanted to make some performance improvements, so 1.3 reduces the number of round trips that you need in order to um, set up the, the handshake. Uh, it applies confidenti confidentiality protection to more of the connection uh, than 1.2 does, and it establishes perfect forward secrecy uh, by default um, as, as the mode of operation. So some significant security improvements, some significant performance improvements. So we published this in August of last year, and about five months later, five months, not five years, um, at the beginning of this year, um, Chrome and Firefox were both supporting it, about 11% of websites were, were uh, sending their traffic over TLS 1.3, and something like 50% of Facebook's traffic was using TLS 1.3. So really significant difference in terms of the deployment time scale. So what made this difference? Uh, why, were the, why were these two stories so different? During the development of TLS 1.3, there were about a dozen implementations that were being developed in parallel with the specification. Um, including many of the ones that are now seeing wide deployment. And what this allowed for was a, basically a near real-time feedback loop between the people who were writing the code and the people who were writing the specs. Um, a process, I think, somewhat reminiscent of, uh, of an open source project was used. So people were using GitHub not only to collaborate on their code, but also to collaborate on the standards documents themselves. And we've developed a bunch of tooling around that to make it easier to do that. Um, they had dedicated Slack channels where uh, people were collaborating in real time, um, fixing bugs, and um, really taking what they were learning from the implementation experience and feeding it back in to make, the, to make the standard better. And we were able to operate this way in the IETF because we have actually a fairly flexible model. This came to be because the people who cared about this technology, who had been involved, some of them, in the development of TLS 1.2 and had seen some of the, the pitfalls and the, um, the drawbacks and the aspects of it that made it slow to deploy um, and that made it uh, less performant or less secure than they wanted it to be. This was the way they wanted to work. There were, there were, more, there were several of them who wanted to collaborate this way and we said, sure, we can, we can tolerate that, we can support that, um, so we did. You've probably heard the tagline, rough consensus and running code. Um, so these people really exercised that, the running code portion of the tagline like to an extreme. Uh, before every IETF meeting, or at the beginning of every IETF meeting now, we have IETF hackathons. Um, there's one this weekend, Saturday and Sunday. 
Um, so the TLS folks were collaborating at every hackathon, at um, interop events in between, both um, uh, you know, virtual ones and, and other meetings. Um, and they were essentially just comparing notes all along the way in order to improve both their implementations and um, the specifications. And part of the reason that they were able to do that is because of the versioning scheme that was implemented in 1.3. This allowed the group to tag draft versions of the spec um, for the purposes of doing interop tests and, and benchmarking. Um, and this was explicit in the design of TLS 1.3. They wanted it to be more extensible and they wanted to be able to do this um, rapid iteration um, along the way. I think probably those of you who've had any exposure to standards or to the IETF have heard the complaint that the standards process is too slow. <laughs> Who's heard this before? <laughs> <laughs> raise your hand. Oh, only a few people. Okay, everybody's afraid to raise their hand. I'm raising my hand. I have heard this every day of my life. Um, so the standards process can take a while, right? It's much easier to agree with yourself to do something and then do it to, than to agree with a thousand of your closest friends that this is the right design, right? It takes a while to come to agreement. Um, and for TLS 1.3, it essentially took four years from start to finish. One of those years, a whole year, was spent dealing with the fact that um, middle boxes were breaking when they saw TLS 1.3 traffic um, in, its, in its draft form. And the only reason that we were able to find that out before we published the final specification is because we had implementations that were being developed along the way. This is how we were able to discover this. Um, so if the standards process is going to take a couple of years for something as, as massive of an effort as TLS was, um, then you might as well, at the point when you're actually ready to finalize the standard, have implementations that are either ready to ship or basically already deployed, which was the situation here. If we look at the, the effort that went into this, the protocol that emerged looked very different from the protocol that's, that started. Um, and that was in large part due not only to this collaboration between implementers and and the, and the spec writers, but also collaboration with the cryptographic research community. Had this, that same kind of fast feedback loop um, where people could, were doing formal verification of the security properties of the protocol and they could feed that back in to the working group. Something like 80 people contributed to the TLS 1.3 spec. Um, and the end result was that this protocol was more deployable, more secure, more efficient um, than it otherwise would have been if any single individual had produced it. Um, I think people who are familiar with open source probably kind of recognize this phenomenon. A, a good open source project also has this quality um, that you get a bunch of different people together and uh, the result of that collaboration and all of those contributions is a better result than it would have been if you were out just working on your own. So we're trying to kind of replicate that a little bit in the IETF process to say, you know, can we make this result better by bringing people together um, even though the end result is just this one spec, we hope that it will support a bunch of different implementations that are all of high quality. So that's kind of the, the baseline story for TLS. For Quick, um, Quick is an ongoing effort and we're following sort of a similar process. Um, some of you are probably familiar with Quick. I know there was a tutorial yesterday. I'm sure it was excellent. <laughs> um, <laughs> So, but for, for people who don't know, uh, QUIC is a, a new transport protocol designed to be an alternative to TCP, um, designed to minimize latency and uh, maximize its chances for wide deployment. And parts of the design were inspired by the experience we had some years ago in developing HTTP2. Uh, so some of the same people have been involved in, and some of the ideas grew out of that. Um, the history here is that Google developed uh, its original version of Quick back in 2012, um, deployed it uh, on its network, and experimented with it for a couple of years before coming to the IETF to propose it for standardization. And at that point, uh, there was plenty of interest uh, in the community, in the industry, in looking into standardizing this. Um, wasn't you know wasn't just a, a, a one organization deal. Uh, lots of people were getting interested in this. And so the IETF effort, effort actually began in 2016 to do the standardization. And uh, the, the hopeful estimates that I've heard is that the first version of the base protocol might be done end of this year or beginning of next year. Yeah, hopeful estimates. Um, 
So the Google specs that they had were used as initial inputs into this work. But since 2016, um, every aspect of the WIRE protocol has changed through the standardization process, um, basically for the purposes of improving it. Um, so Google started out with some bespoke uh, crypto, and that has been replaced with uh, TLS 1.3, essentially. Other examples, we've added support for unidirectional streams so we can support a wider variety of applications. Um, we've solidified which aspects of the protocol are to remain invariant over time. I'll talk about that a little bit more later. Um, there's a new HTTP header compression scheme for use with um, what is now called HTTP3, HTTP over quick. Um, so lots of changes have occurred during the process of, of standardization. So I think if we come back to this original question of um, do you need a standard if you have a good implementation? The experience with Quick is, is fairly um, instructive. Google, or any individual implementer, could have toiled away on their own implementation, and I'm sure we all would have benefited from that. Um, people would have enjoyed this new protocol once it got out there, um, you know, seen the performance enhancements and so on. Um, but the, this open public process of standardization has produced, I think, a stronger, or will produce, a stronger and more uh, enduring uh, design that will benefit the whole internet um, and not just those who choose to adopt a, a, a single implementation. Um, and that includes you know, users of other browsers, other operating systems, um, uh, different web server software, um, application stacks that are uh, written in several different languages. Um, there's a whole ecosystem that can benefit from the standardization benefits that uh, accrue when people come together. I also think that documenting the design is allowing for many of these implementations to, to um, sprout up and come into their own. So there's now nearly two dozen implementations of Quick. Many of them are open source. Um, and as with TLS, the working group tags specific versions to do interop testing. Um, they do this again at IETF hackathons. Uh, the Quick Group meets um, physically and virtually in between the IETF meetings um, to further this effort. Um, they use the Slack channel. They have shared uh, spreadsheets to track interops between um, all of the different implementations. Um, so it's that same style of collaborative work that that was used uh, with the TLS group. I think this experience with Quick actually provides an interesting occasion to think about. Um, some of the narratives that are out there about this relationship between open standards and open source. Um, as I said, we have this tagline, rough consensus and running code. Um, but running code has gotten easier to produce since uh, the, the person who spoke that line first spoke it. Um, someone recently said to me that every bad idea that they see in the IETF nowadays is accompanied by running code. Um, <laughs> think to yourself about whether you think that's true or not. Um, I think there's probably some truth to that. Um, but that, that just means that every idea that is coming into the IATF more or less um, is, is accompanied by running code, um, which, is, which is on the one hand good. On the other hand, I think that means that in some people's minds, the bar for whether they're going to engage in a standardization effort has kind of shifted up a little bit. And the question is not, do you have running code? Like, can you throw something up on GitHub? but um, do you have code that's running at scale and potentially at, at internet scale? And I think the early demonstrations of Quick um, at Google were actually pretty seminal in terms of um, motivating other people to get involved because they could see some of the results, they could see that um, uh, this might be something that could work at scale. And for those who are uh, you know, steeped in, in transport protocols, you know that there's like this graveyard of transport protocols that have that never really reached the, um, uh, you know, achieved the kind of deployment that people expected them to at design time or hoped that they would. And standardization requires some investment of time. So people want to know that th this investment of time is going to be worthwhile. Um, and so, you know, seeing a demonstration of that at the outset can be useful. And so I think that's, that's worth thinking about because at this point, you know, seeing some demo code, even seeing that, uh, you know, somebody's new idea got accepted as a patch into the Linux kernel, like that might not be enough to convince people that they should go invest their time to standardize. Um, it, it might be that, that you need more than that or you need multiple demonstrations of that. Um, so the bar might be moving up a little bit. 
I think there's another narrative that is out there about standards, um, maybe not as much about the IETF, but, um, but sometimes, and that's that you have these internet giants and they come to standards organizations and they get a rubber stamp on their thing because they're so giant. How could we say no to them? How could we say no to Google or Cisco or Cloudflare if they want to come in and, um, and, and get their new protocol standardized just as it is? And I think the, the history with Quick really belies that narrative. Um, as I said before, massive changes to the protocol since it came in for standardization. Obviously, people take note of who is promulgating a particular idea, who is coming to the microphone to offer um, an opinion, and they think about what, it, what might the market trajectory be for a particular technology. But since we run an open process that lets anybody participate as an individual, um, and it operates on the basis of this rough consensus, that means it's r actually really, really difficult for a single individual or a single entity to just get their thing rubber stamped. It's equally difficult for a single individual to block something from proceeding if, if most other people want to. Um, so I think this is interesting because it's different from some of the more um, tightly controlled processes that might be out there. So some open source projects don't really have this flavor, right? Like whether, whether something gets accepted or not is up to potentially a very small number of people um, who decide, uh, hey, I like you or I like your thing, I'm gonna accept it um, or not. And it's the same thing with standards organizations. There's lots of standards organizations that are much more tightly controlled, have a sort of one member, one vote kind of orientation um, and can be kind of politicized uh, in terms of gathering the votes. And so I think the IETF in particular is unique in that we have this open consensus-based process uh, and the, the way that the process is run defends against um, that kind of manipulation. So I'll switch gears and talk a little bit about um, protocol ossification. And these things are actually somewhat related um, in terms of how we ended up designing these two protocols um, and uh, both you know, the, the process that went into it and then the design that, that came out of it. So when I say protocol, protocol ossification, what I mean is um, the state in which a protocol cannot be successfully extended um, or updated because the deployed environment um, has basically frozen the protocol in place. So uh, out on the network, we have NATs, we have firewalls, we have proxies, we have TCP optimizers, we have um, every kind of middle box that you like, and they bake assumptions about a protocol into their own functionality, sometimes to the point where a protocol breaks if the protocol functionality changes. Um, because it, it, trying to extend it or trying to update it, you can't get it through the middle box. So concerns about ossification go back many decades um, and up and down the stack, right? IP, TCP, TLS, HTTP, like many commonly used protocols, um, people have been concerned about their ossification or have, have witnessed it happen um, over the years. And if we think about the two examples from today, TLS 1.3 and QUIC, they have really, really ambitious goals. So TLS 1.3, all we wanted to do was replace the most widely used security protocol on the internet. QUIC, all we want to do is uh, provide an alternative to TCP, right? Um, and if, the, if you're going to have that kind of goal, you have to realize that you're like way beyond the point of um, sort of wishing away this middle box environment or, or hoping that um, it will change so that your protocol can get deployed. Um, you can't expect the behavior of middle boxes to change in any kind of mass or uniform way at this point. So both of these protocols uh, essentially took the deployed reality of in-network processing that, that we know happens um, very seriously into the, into the foundations of their design. For TLS 1.3, as I mentioned earlier, the process of standardization was actually also a process of realizing what this deployed reality is. So in 2017, some of the major browsers uh, started uh, shipping the, what was the current draft of TLS 1.3 um, a little bit more broadly than they had been previously, and they started taking some measurements. And they noticed that the error rates for successfully negotiating 1.3 were much higher than they were for 1.2. Um, and after some fairly extensive investigation, uh, they found that different kinds of middle boxes were interfering with the TLS hands handshake in different ways, um, essentially causing 1.3 connections to fail. And at this point, they spent some time making a fairly significant change to the 1.3 protocol so that it looks like 
TLS 1.2 session resumption on the wire, like including dummy values that have no other purpose other than to make the protocol uh, essentially masquerade as 1.2 so that it will get through these middle boxes. If you go look at the design of it today, that's what you'll see. Um, and with this change made, people made this change and then they updated their implementations and they started testing again, the error rates dropped. This also, I think, points at one of the other few tools that we have in the toolbox to defend against protocol ossification or to mitigate it, and that's encryption. So in 1.3, um, as I mentioned, a greater portion of the connection is, uh, is encrypted. Essentially, all messages after the server hello are encrypted. And this, not only, this was done not only because it just uh, generally improves the privacy properties of the protocol, but it also prevents um, middle boxes from tinkering with the handshake um, in the way that they were in this process that people discovered uh, when they were doing the design. So this was like an explicit decision on the part of the designers of the protocol um, that in order to give 1.3 a, a better chance of not only passing through the network successfully today, but of being able to change and adapt in the future to future middle box intervention, um, the way, what they needed to do was encrypt more of, of the connection. And Quick has adopted a similar strategy. So if you look at the design of Quick, it's designed around the existing timeout behavior of NATS. Um, it's a UDP-based protocol, and so it has to deal with the fact that, um, you know, the NAT bindings will time out, and um, there's a mechanism that's designed into the protocol whereby there's a connection ID in every single packet, which allows the quick connection to survive these, these NAT rebindings. It didn't have to be this way. This is the way that it's designed now. Um, it could have been designed with a, um, a, a NAT visible connection close in the same way that, uh, that TCP has. But nobody believed that the deployed middle boxes would accommodate this. And so as a result, Quick again, was designed explicitly to maximize uh, the likelihood of successful deployment given the existing <coughs> middle box environment. In addition, the vast majority of the Quick packet is encrypted. So um, only very minimal control information is revealed in clear text, this connection ID and the, and the version number, essentially. Um, and there's some initial encryption keys that are used before the TLS 1.3 handshake completes, and then the TLS 1.3 keys are used to encrypt the packet from there on. So the kinds of um, in-network manipulations that we've seen over the decades um, of TCP, uh, you know, manipulating acknowledgments and uh, window size and uh, resetting connections and so forth, um, extremely difficult with Quick because all of that information is now going to be encrypted and, and not visible um, to the network. And again, this was like an explicit design decision, not only to make this protocol work today, but to give it some flexibility so that we can change it in the future and it will still work, um, regardless of, of how middle box behavior has changed. So um, two tactics, one, uh, design for deployed reality, two, encrypt. Um, there's two more that also, I think, are important to realize part of the tool, as part of the toolkit. Um, one is declaring protocol invariance in advance, and the other one is what we call greasing. So um, declaring protocol invariance means essentially documenting the properties of the protocol that aren't going to change uh, even when new versions of the protocol are produced. So this basically represents a promise made by the developers of the, of the protocol itself that um, certain bits on the wire and behaviors associated with, um, with the, the wire image will be preserved through future new versions um, of the protocol. The idea is that by documenting what can't change, uh, you allow anything else to change. So it gives you some flexibility in the future. Uh, there's a section in the TLS 1.3 spec that outlines what, um, what these invariants are for TLS 1.3, and for Quick, there's like a whole separate document which is talking about what these are if you want to check it out. I think it's interesting to come back to the, the beginning of, of the talk to consider this through this lens of open source versus open standards. Um, I think that this invariant declaration has a much greater uh, chance of being useful and, and successful um, if it's documented in, in a standard 
than if it's like an agreement among parties who are um, jointly developing an implementation. Because generally speaking, it's much harder to change a standard than it is to um, change an implementation. And that's kind of the whole point of doing a big broad-based consensus process is that um, you know, once you've inked it, you don't expect it to change for you know, some, some long period of time. So that kind of thing can have a lot more force if it's written down in a specification than if it's just coded. Um, so it's kind of an interesting uh, difference between the two models again. Now greasing is meant to address this problem where um, protocol extension points um, or version negotiation mechanisms uh, go unused in a protocol. So if you think about the very first time that you're gonna design a protocol, um, you probably at this point know that you should build in an, extend, an extensibility mechanism and a version negotiation mechanism, but in the first instance, nobody's using those because you're just on the first version and there aren't any extensions. So um, as a result, what we found over time is that implementations end up um, being designed such that they um, can't support or, or can't handle these things when they do show up later. And, and, and similarly, middle boxes get designed where they, they choke when they start to see these new things, these new extensions or new versions. Um, they don't know what to do with them because in the first instance, they weren't designed to accommodate them even though um, you know, all of this was, was designed into the protocol itself. So if we consider these extension points as joints that have rusted shut, uh, then you can think of the idea of grease is to ensure that um, implementations uh, that are regularly exposed to unknown values in these fields, we'll be able to accommodate them in the future um, when actual extensions um, or new versions are, are designed. So for TLS, there's a set of grease values that have been proposed for all of the extension points for the signature algorithms and the versions and, and everything. Um, the clients are, the proposal is that the clients would um, essentially advertise these at random and that servers would treat them as unknown values um, at, at present. <laughs> And the values are chosen to cover the full code point space so that um, implementations don't end up uh, you know, being built such that just this one section of the code point space, which has been greased, uh, is the one that they ossify around. So that's the idea, anyway. Um, with Quick, the version number field uh, is, the, the proposal is to grease the version number field um, by reserving a certain set of values across the whole um, code point space. Uh, that clients can advertise and then expect servers to initiate version negotiation and servers can advertise them and um, basically they expect clients to ignore them. So I think, you know, this is like kind of a smaller technique. It's definitely not any sort of solution on its own. Um, it's helpful if you, if you marry this technique to the, the process of um, building implementations along with the specifications because you can see early on where there might be pain points. Um, if, you, if you grease a particular extension point, develop an implementation um, before we finalize the standard, and things start to break, then you know that, uh, that you need more support for these extensibility mechanisms before um, people are gonna be ready to ship this thing. So it gives you kind of an early, an early warning. So in summary, uh, what's the strategy here? Accommodate the deployed reality, encrypt, declare your protocol invariants, and Greece. That's kind of what the, I think the, the state of the art of the thinking is um, around uh, preventing future protocol ossification, and this is on the basis of some of these recent um, design efforts. So, if all of this sounds like the most fun in the world to you and you cannot wait to get involved in efforts such as these in the IETF, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about how we work and how you can get involved. So I mentioned before the IETF hackathon, and I wanted to leave with, with this because I really do think at this point, for uh, especially for people who are um, uh, develop, development oriented, it's totally the easiest entry point into uh, the world of the IETF. So um, the IETF hackathon happens the weekend at the start of each IETF meeting, um, three times per year, all around the world. Uh, as I said, this Saturday and Sunday, you can come join us at the Hilton in Prague. Um, uh, we have already more than 275 people registered. We have um, more than 40 projects, including uh, a bunch of projects that are, have also been featured here on the NetDev agenda, um, TCP Prague, some um, IPv6 Path MTU discovery stuff, lots of quick stuff going on, and, and many, many more. Um, so I encourage you to to check out the projects, and um, the hackathon is free, 
So um, uh, no fees required. Uh, there's food, there's beer, um, there's, there's a good time to be had. Um, it's not your typical kind of hackathon. It's very much more collaborative uh, style than it is a competitive style. So the idea is that you can walk in, um, find an interesting project to work on, um, find other like-minded people, and, um, and maybe learn something new, and, and maybe contribute something back. Um, uh, you also don't need to know anything about the IETF or IETF protocols. Uh, we have organizers there who can help um, help you find a project, help uh, introduce you to people who are um, IETF veterans who can explain to you what's going on and can get you up to speed. Um, so I really encourage you to check it out. If not this time, then and maybe some some future hackathon. Um, just a little bit about how the IETF is organized. Uh, so we have we organize our work into working groups, um, which are fairly small and focused um, in terms of the scope of the work that they cover. Typically, some of the older working groups are a little bit bigger in scope, but more recently we've been creating working groups that are a little, a little bit more focused. And those working groups divide into six different technical areas. Um, so internet routing, ops and management, transport, um, apps and real time and security. You can see some examples, those are just examples of different protocols that have been developed um, or are currently being developed in each area. So you can kind of get a sense of, um, you know, if the things that you're interested in, where they might lie. And um, each of these working groups that we have, we have about 120 of them, um, they have a mailing list. Many of them are now uh, using GitHub repositories to do their collaborative work. Um, and uh, they have they sort of process documents, which I'll which I'll talk about in a second. Separate from this, you may also be some of you may be familiar with the IRTF, the Internet uh, Research Task Force, which is our sister organization. Um, not pictured on the slide, but the IRTF uh, organizes research groups. I think there's about 15 or 20 of them, um, and those are a little bit more focused on as you might expect, uh, uh, research, more experimental kind of protocol development, um, but some of the work that you may have heard about this week or that, that you may be familiar with will happen in the IRTF research groups, and they meet at the same time during IETF meetings as well. So if you wanted to come and, and, and start to get your hands a little bit dirty in IETF work, um, there's a few different things that might be useful to know about, uh, to figure out how, how would you get started. So here you can see um, the IETF data tracker, which is where we keep track of all of our working groups and, and the, the documents that we're producing. Um, this is just an example from the, from the quick working group. Um, so as I said, every working group has a mailing list. If you're interested in a particular technology, joining, joining the mailing list is probably a good thing to do. Um, you can also see the tools that they use for collaboration. So um, not every group uh, has these, but many of the groups do. Um, you can join the Slack channel, or you can, you can find their stuff on GitHub. And then finally, um, you can find the people. And I would really encourage you to do this. If there's, if there's anything at all that interests you in the IETF, like sending a targeted email to one of the people that you can find here in the IETF data tracker is a great way to um, just get an introduction, get some guidance about um, you know, exactly what to do or how to start or what to read or who else to talk to. Um, it's, it's really... A, a, a community, I mean, that's what we call it all the time, the IETF community, that's what it is. Um, so I would encourage you to, to, you know, find the people who are knowledgeable about the area that you're interested in and, and reach out to them directly. I think, I guess one other thing I would say about that in particular, um, you know, the IETF has been around for more than 30 years. There's a lot of history. Um, there's a lot of ideas that have been proposed before. And there is sometimes hostility to people who come and propose the same idea again, even if they have no idea that it was proposed before. So reaching out to people in advance, trying to understand the lay of the land, um, what, el what, what context, what history do you need to know in order to thoughtfully engage um, with the standards process, um, it can be useful to, to, to talk to people first just to get a sense of that. So, if you start to engage in, in one of these working groups, what you'll see is that really the unit of the of discussion is what we call an internet draft. Um, here you're looking at an example. I think this um, IFA technology was uh, on the agenda here at NetDev earlier this week. Um, so internet drafts, anybody can write one. Anybody can write one. Um, you can 
write one up, submit it to our repository. It's fairly straightforward. A lot of people who write a draft for the first time will collaborate with people who have done it before um, just to kind of understand the lay of the land a little bit better. Um, and this is basically just a draft specification. So uh, somebody who eventually wants their thing to be standardized as an RFC, all RFCs start out as internet drafts. One thing I just wanted to point out because it's an often a point of confusion is the naming convention for internet drafts. So here what you're looking at is what we call an individual draft, which means that um, it's been proposed by some individual or some set of individuals. It hasn't been formally adopted as a work item of any IETF working group yet. So you can see that it's named with the last name of one of the authors. Um, and the working group to which it, it hopes to one day be adopted. Um, as opposed to if you were to see a working group draft, um, it would not have the name of the author in it, it would just have the name of the working group in it. So if you're out there on the internet reading drafts, um, you might take note of the naming convention in order to get, try to get some sense of like how far along in the process is this document. Um, typically a document with an individual's name in it is not as far along as a document that doesn't have an individual's name in it. Uh, another really useful thing to understand is that not all RFCs are created equal. So there are um, multiple different kinds of RFCs um, and only some of them are like standards that you, you would want to code to. Um, so this one that you're looking at is, uh, is HTTP 1.1 RFC uh, 7230. So this is what we call a proposed standard, which is very confusingly named because most of the things that you think of as standards on the internet are proposed standards. They're not really proposed. They've been finalized, um, but we have a lot of history and baggage in the IETF, which is why they're called proposed standards. <laughs> um, but in any event, they've resolved you know, known uh, uh, design choices. There's been significant community review of these things. They are stable, um, and wide deployment of proposed standards is very much encouraged. Um, then we have um, experimental standards where protocol might still be somewhat in development um, but ready for experimentation. And sometimes people will publish an RFC as experimental first to get some of that uh, experimental experience and aim later to upgrade it to a proposed standard. So for example, BGP followed this path. It was originally specified as experimental. Um, originally, <laughs> there's a version of BGP which was specified as experimental and eventually it was upgraded to, um, to proposed standard. Uh, and then lastly, we have informational uh, documents which, uh, which don't really specify standards of any kind. They're just general information for, um, for the benefit of the community. Um, so you will often see things like use cases um, or like operational considerations uh, surrounding a particular protocol. Uh, those will be published as informational um, RFCs. So I talked a little bit about the hackathon, a little bit about um, uh, internet drafts um, and, and working groups, uh, but there's also some other ways that you can uh, engage with the IETF community or think about uh, why you might want to or what you might get out of it. Um, so one thing is that you can just, you can discover some like-minded people. Um, that's part of the beauty of the IETF. You can come and people will be very interested in your implementation experience, like what you've, what you've seen in the wild, like what your experiences have been, um, particularly with implementing protocols where those people design them but they don't know that much about um, what's happening in, in implementation land. Um, that will very much be valued. And so um, just coming to, to kind of get a sense of people, um, maybe find some other people who are working in the same area as you um, can be quite beneficial. I'm not gonna say that we are uniformly friendly in the IETF, uh, but nobody actually bites. So, um, you know, it's, it's a community that's worth exploring. Um, the other cool thing is that we have some really deep and uh, extensive expertise in particular areas. Um, so, namely, security, privacy, um, congestion control, operations. All uh, proposed standards go through a process of um, community-wide review where they get specific reviews um, for those aspects um, and, and many others. Um, and in general, we just have uh, sort of a locus of, of experts on some of those issues. So I think it might be interesting to think about, um, even if you don't care about standardizing your thing, but you have a cool idea and you kind of want to get some feedback about 
um, some of those aspects, uh, like you're not really sure uh, what the security properties are, are of this thing that you've designed, but you, you could really use some help to understand that or like get some kind of review um, of that thing that you're working on. Um, I think it might be interesting to think about uh, would there be a way for us to do that in the IETF. It's not something that we do uh, very often right now where somebody comes and says, can I just get the cross area review part um, but, but not the RFC output? Um, but it might be something uh, interesting to think about or, or explore. Um, the other thing that we're doing, uh, that we started doing recently, is to support, um, uh, to specifically support the development of tooling uh, to help get IETF standards uh, further deployed. So right now we're doing this with Yang, uh, the, the data modeling language. Um, we have this tool, this set of tools called the Yang Catalog, um, and the IETF is directly supporting the development of this as an open source project. Um, where the Yang catalog helps people visualize Yang models, understand how, what the relationships are uh, between them and the dependencies, um, to validate models, and, um, and that applies not just to models that are produced in IETF standards, but also um, kind of across the industry. And so if there's that kind of thing that you can think of, like, hey, it would be really great if we had more tooling support in order to um, you know, get this protocol out the door, uh, that's something that we can also entertain as well, um, and I would be interested to hear um, ideas about that. So, um, oops. I've included here just a bunch of references to various different things that I talked about um, today, and you can look at those later. I would be thrilled to get questions, comments, tomatoes, give you your time back, any of the above. <laughs> That working now? Great. Hi, I'm Dave Tack. Um, I'm are over you? here, Miss. Right here. Oh, hi. <laughs> nice to meet you finally. Um, on Quick, I've always wanted to get the history always straight. Quick was started by Jim Roskind, a really brilliant renegade engineer who reanalyzed all the properties of TCP, and through 13 vision revisions. Deployed, wrote and deployed the code until it hit an ITF standard. Okay. Thanks for that. Oh. Okay. Uh, so I have one experience with IETF, like we just from a point of view of a kernel developer, when I was uh, implementing a standard, draft standard uh, for like, into the kernel, and I found, I had some concerns or find some issues with the, with the, with the, with the standard or the, the draft standard. And yeah, I, I got to the mailing list, sent a question there, I couldn't like, reply, uh, okay, yeah, we might work on that or we might do something with that. And yeah, indeed, it was like partially addressed. Then I found another issue, wrote to the same mailing list, got no reply. So my question is, from point of view of like someone not uh, really in the process and not understanding the process and so on, it was like black box to me. I did not really know what to do, uh, what should I do more to, to address my concerns and like how to influence the standard without going anywhere in person because like if you, going on your own, like on your own budget, that's like not always feasible. So what would be your advice for me in similar situation? Yeah, so um, I don't think that's, that's a terribly uncommon experience. Um, a couple things. First, you, don't, you definitely don't have to come in person, um, but as I noted, um, targeted outreach to particular people, um, so in this case, like the working group chairs potentially, um, could be a, a follow-on step if you don't get a response. Um, the difficulty with the IETF in particular is that it's all volunteers. So everybody is there on their own dime or, you know, on their employer's dime, essentially. Um, and if it's not, you know, part of their workflow to care about the issue that you raised, then you might not get an answer. And that's, that's j just like kind of the way that it works because it's, everybody is there 
on their own time, essentially. Um, so it's you know it's something that we have to deal with. But um, yeah, kind of escalating up to uh, you know sending an individual email to somebody who uh, appears to be in charge of of the group or the list or what have you uh, is probably uh, the next right step if you if you don't get a response out the first time. Um, but mailing the list with your concerns was definitely you know the right thing to do in the first instance. Yeah, I mean this is again to the this part about the timelines, like this is this is part of why we we can't ever guarantee like this will be done on X date, because um, you know unlike other consortia or whatever, it's all volunteer based. If, if the person who's authoring something just disappears off the face of the earth, like we can't make it, we can't cause it to conclude. So. So. Um, so I have a question. My management uh, asked me, what is the ROI of this idea in the data center world where any co-op doesn't matter so much anymore? Uh, sure, so I think, I mean, it's gonna be use case specific, so there's certainly some like areas where you don't need standards. Um, but I think there's, a, there's some other benefits, uh, right? So um, if, you, if you have a design and you do want to like socialize the properties of it, if you wanna so get this kind of review. Matter. So I'm sorry? So it doesn't matter for most data centers. So then what? Well, I mean, we have a, we have a, a bunch of people who are coming to do data center focused work of different kinds at the IETF, so it does matter to some people, apparently. Like, not everybody is single sourcing everything in their data center. Um, but again, it's it's not only about, the value of the IETF is not only about interop, right? It can be about broad review, it can be about, you know, getting more eyes on, your, on the thing that you're designing, um, it can be about learning what other people are doing. Um, it's not only, like, if, um, if I get, I have to get my thing standardized and otherwise I don't care, right? So I'll follow up with a comment, actually. So, uh, I mean, specifically, since we're in a Linux conversation here and in the Linux community, one of the things that Linux has is an ability to sort of enforce, right, in some sense, with their standards and de facto code. I think maybe the question you're asking is in the context of ITF, because your best case is a de facto standard, not or a pre-standard draft, right? What are there ways in which it could be made into something more actionable so that if you have an ITF agreement, right, you have the, the broad review, how does it go into the next phase? Does it, I mean, you know, are, is implementation a requirement or can, can communities like Linux be used such that those things become enforced at some point? So, um, so I talked about this, this moniker proposed standard, right? So there's another label, which I didn't even put up there, um, which is called internet standard, which is like the next level in which you must demonstrate interoperability between multiple implementations. Um, so that avenue is available, but typically uh, there's been very few instances where anybody cared to use it because it requires so much effort. Um, and the other thing we say in the ITF is that we are not the protocol police, right? So it, it's part of kind of the scoping of our role. Like we put these things out into the world. Um, we're trying to design them so that they get deployed and used, um, but we can't make anybody use them and we don't want to try to. Um, so this, I think the kind of informal collaboration, like getting people involved who are gonna go deploy is, is kind of the best model for us. Thank you for that talk, Alyssa. I think it was quite a nice thing to do here, especially given the NetDev and ITFR happening back to back. Um, you suggested an alternative tagline, bad ideas in running code. <laughs> I'm not going to publicize that, but it sounds wonderful. Um, uh, the, the running code part of that, which you uh, spoke to, I think is, is, is very instructive that it's not just about compiling code, it's not about code that can run, it's about code that is running on a global scale. And that's super helpful um, to, to mention and to discuss because I think it's, it's one, of those, one of those points that this community is good at is producing code and actually getting it running. Uh, and uh, we've seen some tension with that in the past, though, between that and the IETF. For example, people who have, uh, as Srijit just mentioned, de facto standards because the code's running everywhere, but there is no standard for it. Um, one example, it's not the best example of it, is Cubic, right? It's running everywhere, not documented anywhere in an internet standard. The only internet condition controller that we ever had a document for was uh, Reno. And um, we now have a document for Cubic. 
but that was almost uh, eight years after it had become effectively a de facto standard on the public internet because it was the default condition controller in Linux. Now, many in the community may not agree that Cubic is the best answer to, to condition control. I certainly don't, and I'm happy to have that battle with anybody who wants, but um, there's a gap there. There's a gap between de facto standards and what we as a community believe is the best standard or what we want to push as a proposed standard. Can you speak to that tension a little bit? I know that there are best current practice documents, but those are again reflective of the best current practices according to the community, not just existing current practice. Yeah, so I think the thing is like, like as I said at the top, there's a variety of different cases, right? If it's the case that it would have been better for the internet if the design of Cubic had been um, you know, standardized first or standardized in tandem with uh, the people who are uh, implementing it and deploying it, then that's like, that's a good lesson, <laughs> right? Which is to say, um, can we identify these cases where uh, it's obvious after the fact that there were design flaws, there was something that could have benefited from having like a, a more of an open process to actually um, write down what is this thing doing so that then other people who were implementing it could do it right or could benefit from everything that had been learned through that process. Um, but it's not, it's not gonna work every time. Like it, it's, it's not even appropriate every time, right? Um, and so I think there's this sense of like, you can, you can like cherry pick your examples and say like, aha, like this is this shows that like you don't need standards, um, but I just I just don't think it's one size fits all. So maybe the question is like, what are the properties of those cases where uh, it would make sense to to try and induce people who you start to see them early on in an implementation effort and say, hey, this is really something where like can we at least like write down a spec and see what happens? Um, so that's that's one thing. But the other thing is like I'm I'm very interested in making the ITF process more functional for people who want to get good ideas deployed, right? And if it's like, our process is, is too cumbersome, or uh, you know, it takes too long, or it's uh, opaque, or all of these things, like those are all things that I would love to try and like improve upon um, and get feedback about how we can improve upon those things. We cannot fix everything. Again, like agreeing something with a thousand of your closest friends is, is always gonna be harder than sitting in, in your house and writing code, uh, but um, but to the extent that we can make improvements uh, in the, on the process side, I'd, I'd love to do that. So we're gonna have one last question here. Hi, just a question about um, the uh, example you gave of Quick in terms of almost requiring a, a uh, implementation that can work at scale in order to get people invested in the process of uh, joining the working group and providing the review process for the RFC. Um, do you have any concerns that this kind of shift in attitude will end up uh, locking out smaller research institutions, academics, um, and people who don't have the resources to deploy at scale? And if so, do you have any ideas of how uh, people who come from academia like myself can still have an impact in terms of deploying and writing RFCs? Yeah, so I think, um, uh, I think it's, a, it's definitely a valid concern. Um, and I don't think it's this you know, deployment at scale thing is, a, is like a, an across the board requirement. So we still have, I think, a fairly uh, vibrant community of academics and researchers who are participating. Um, but I do think they're a, a little bit at a disadvantage if the decision making process revolves around like, are the big players interested in this? Um, and that is that is a dynamic, honestly, which people sort of feel like it's new, but I don't really think it's new. Like, I work at Cisco. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that, like, 15 or 20 years ago, long before I worked at Cisco, uh, it mattered a lot whether it was, like, Cisco and Juniper who are interested in doing something in routing, and then it's either going to happen or it's not going to happen. Um, so I don't think this is necessarily a new dynamic, um, but it's, uh, it's definitely something that... Um, that I am cognizant of and that, that people uh, see in the IETF. On the other hand, I feel like, um, you know, given the, the openness of the process, people are still, like, totally open to an idea no matter where it comes from if it's a good idea. Uh, and, and as I said, we still have uh, a fairly vibrant community of academics, and I think actually more 
sort of research activity now than we have than we had like five years ago in the ITF. Um, so it's something to watch out for, um, and there's not a ton that we can do about it within the confines of our process. Um, but I, I don't think it's like totally dire. Uh, thanks. Uh, we got small. We're just going to wrap it up oh. here because people want to, they like their coffee. <laughs> so we have a s couple of gifts. This one is from collaboration between academic community and open source. Uh, awesome. Thank you. From one of our very own, the Torque. Yeah. And another small gift. Thank you. Open it with <laughs> you. Thank you. <laughs>